Hello, I'm Virginia. Welcome to my discussion of breast milk banking in the United States and the modern milk donor experience. A special thank you to my advisor, Dr. Bria Dunham, for guiding me through this project. And really quick before we get started, I do want to issue a trigger warning. This presentation will be touching on topics of motherhood, racial and gender discrimination, and enslavement. So if anyone is uncomfortable with any of those topics, feel free to step out now or at any time during the presentation. Okay. So, to give a brief overview of my project, in the United States, there are no federal regulatory guidelines on how to collect, store, regulate, and distribute breast milk, which makes it very difficult to present potential donors with accurate and streamlined information. And I investigate this issue in an academic paper that goes through the history of milk banking and how that's led to the state of the industry today, and a qualitative analysis of a donor experience survey. And I've chosen to specifically focus on breast milk donors because if new policies are going to be developed to streamline the milk baking process, it's important to give donors a platform to advocate for their needs as well. So why do we care about breast milk? Breast milk is the first food that an infant receives after being born, and it is chock full of hormones, carbohydrates, fats, and enzymes that have plenty of health benefits. It has been shown that receiving breast milk for the first six to 18 months of life can reduce the risk of respiratory illness, lower blood pressure, and improve vision in young children. The World Health Organization currently classifies breast milk as the most nutritious form of child feeding. So if it is available, it is recommended that children receive breast milk. And that leads us to milk banking. So in the early 1900s, as healthcare was expanding in the US, there became a need for hospitals to have an in-house supply of breast milk. And that leads us to breast milk banking. And milk banks are third-party facilities that facilitate the collection of milk from a donor, the storage, and then the distribution to a client. And the first milk bank in the United States was actually opened right here in Boston in 1910, the floating hospital, as you can see right there. So today, the most common uses of donor milk are for NICUs and hospitals but milk can also be used for displaced or abandoned or orphaned children or individual families that cannot produce breast milk or do not want to breastfeed for whatever reason. And that brings us to who is giving this milk. So before milk banks, wet nurses were very common in the United States and wet nursing is a formal role of providing milk for a child that is not your own. And most wet nurses were women of color and immigrant women and in the United States, um, wet nursing originated as a position for enslaved women that were forced to feed the children of their owners at the expense of their own families. And then, after emancipation, hospitals began hiring these wet nurses to work as in-resident nurses in their hospitals to feed the infants born in their facilities. And now, hired is a loose term here because the pay was often inconsistent and very, very low. So it resembled a bit more of an indentured servitude than gainful employment. Um, but then milk banks came along and basically replaced the need for in-resident wet nurses. So we saw a transition from the wet nurses becoming the milk donors, and facilities differed on whether or not they would pay people to receive their milk. But then something interesting happened around the 1950s. We saw that the demographic of donors shifted from mostly women of color to white, wealthier women, and this coincided with the rise of the, quote, cult of motherhood in post-war America. So after World War II, as the nuclear family became more of the standard for um, the American idyllic family, uh, breast milk became a symbol of motherhood rather than just a means to an end to feed your child for the first time in modern American history. And so then women that fit the standard of what a mother should look like were all of a sudden encouraged to donate milk. But then what we see going into the modern day, which is very interesting, is that there is a divide between who is giving milk for free, or quote, a donor, and who is selling milk because most campaigns for bought and sold milk still target communities of color. So this brings into question whose milk is seen as a gift and whose milk is seen as a commodity to be bought and sold. And this is perpetuated by the lack of standardization that I talked a little bit about earlier. So milk can be categorized as either a food, a medicine, or a human tissue. And all these categories have different regulatory labor costs, time costs, and management costs. So it's very difficult for different facilities to know what they're being received, how to market to donors, and everyone basically has to come up with their own rules for how to treat their milk because there are no federal standards. And most states neglect to categorize breast milk within their state, so it's up to individual facilities. And this leaves a lot of room for harmful or insensitive policies that don't take into account the communities that they are serving. And that brings me to my research. So I distributed an online milk donor survey and also a 
paper survey to Milk Bank employees. And I decided to also include Milk Bank employees into my research to kind of try to bridge that gap between what donors need and what services Milk Banks are providing. So the survey, as you can see here, had some demographic information. And then there were also free response questions where people could talk more about their experience with the milk banking system. And so quick demographic breakdown. I got about seven respondents from the donors and four milk bank employee respondents. And everyone broke down pretty evenly between age, um, relationship status, education, and race. So quite a small sample. And then people were asked to talk about what motivated them to donate milk. And so three themes emerged. They wanted to make sure their milk was safe. Um, they expressed having an excess of milk. And they expressed a want to help the community, either by giving to a mother or a child, a child who didn't have a family, or helping babies in the NICU for a few examples. And then improvements that donors recognized um, that could help or facilitate their process was not knowing what medications affected their don donation eligibility, extraneous testing, repetitive paperwork, expensive equipment like milk bags, and a general lack of information. And so requests included more healthcare support, access to healthy foods, free equipment, and generally more streamlined information. And one donor did write in saying monetary compensation. And then both parties were also asked to report what they thought were the most important informative resources to learn more about milk banking. So donor responses were in blue. And then employee responses were in red. And as you can see, what's really interesting is that it seems to be that there are resources milk banks are promoting, but for some reason, donors are not accessing, particularly OBGYNs, midwives, and lactation consultants. And what's also of note here is that these resources seem to be e of easy access to the milk bank, but there's, for some reason, milk donors don't find them very helpful, at least from this sample size. And so with that, Again, this is a very small sample, so this research needs to be scaled up to learn more about um, what services milk donors are in need of and what policies might be more helpful for protecting them and their reproductive rights. And so I propose partnering with milk banks to lead this research so there's a cl more clear understanding of the services they provide and how it's connecting with the communities with a focus on community-led research and policy development. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Presentation, really excited to see it again. Um, do, is there any advocacy or any groups right now that are looking to write or create federal regulations for breast milk donation? So what's really interesting is there's not a lot of discussion right now about new federal policies, but there are a lot of community groups, particularly in black communities, advocating for the production of black mothers, um, particularly out of Detroit, the Mother's Milk Collective. Um, they ran a really successful campaign for, to, for a lab to stop targeting their donations to, that was basically paying donors very little money and encouraging them to give up other sources of income to be able to donate milk. Um, so there are a lot of, there are a few advocacy groups out there that I've seen advocating for individual communities um, and making sure everyone is protected and compensated for their labor and milk, uh, but there aren't any national movements or pushes for federal regulations at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm just curious about the classification. You said there's a little bit of vagueness legally. Uh, do you know how this would compare to something like uh, other that's also donated like blood? Yes, it's actually super interesting because um, they're classified as medical products of human origin. And so that's blood, um, sperm, eggs, et cetera. And everything else has regulations um, as mostly, most of them are tissues, but every other one has a set standard of guidelines of this is how you treat this product. It is like this, it is like medicine, it's like a tissue. Breast milk is the only one to have no set guidelines. Um, there's also a lot of interesting literature on why milk donation is not included in a lot of giving philosophy like blood is. So there seems to be a bit of a discrepancy between including breast milk in the conversation with other similar medical products. Yes. Thanks. I, I guess as a follow-up to that, um, in, in the ideal world, if a federal regulations get passed for this, what agencies would it fall to to regulate this breast milk? And is it, do you think that'd be different across some states? Like some states would leave it up to their like food and drug equivalent or the health system? Right, yeah, that's basically what's happening now. So um, there are 
three states, California, Maine, and New York, that classify it as a tissue, and so it's, it falls under um, their medical tissue, human tissue regulation. So each state can choose, oh, I want to regulate this as a food, or I want to regulate this as a medicine, or they can neglect to categorize it at all. Um, and so what I'm proposing is uh, whichever category it falls into, it needs to have one standard set of regulations. So every facility in the country treats it the same way. And also it's very important so people know what they're receiving and they know how it was treated and they know the quality of it. And people that give milk, it was also identified that they want to know, again, with the safety, they want to know it's being treated well. They want to know it's with a certain standard, whatever that standard is. So I'm not advocating for one on top of the other, more so that we pick one and we stick with it so everyone knows what they're getting. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question, if anyone has any. Yes. Amazing work, uh, Virginia. Um, so, you know, I've, you had a pretty, you gave yourself a pretty robust historical background in the field. And um, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about, um, like, what, what surprised you the most um, about your findings and, um, and also, like in terms of the the distinction between um, between blood and milk, I know we've talked about. There's a lot of interesting things to look into there, and I think one of the things is it just like from my experience as a as a donor is that you um, you're and part of the discrepancy maybe with providers not educating um, pregnant and birthing people about. Uh, donating milk in the way that the banks expect them to is that with blood donation, you're you're encouraged to produce extra blood for the sake of donation. That's considered like a charitable act, right? So it's like you give blood, you you still need it, but like you'll make more. But with milk, it's very like there's a very cautious attitude of you should do whatever you could possibly do to use your own before you donate, and you should only donate what is an absolute excess, what you are incapable of using for your own family. Um, so I, I don't know how you, what you think about that dynamic. Is that, is that the way we should be thinking about this? Is that the message that we should send? Or is there potentially a kind of a more, a more open-ended or radical way of looking at this, this kind of giving? Um, Thank you, great question. Um, a lot in there. So. Um, on one hand, yeah, it is, is an issue, particularly with campaigns that promote selling milk. Um, there's this worry that they're going to encourage people to um, overextend themselves or try to produce milk at a rate that is not healthy for them in order to donate um, to receive money, or that uh, encouraging donation will prompt women to, or childbearing people um, to donate milk that they don't actually have in excess. Uh, and that also leads into, with the historical background, um, the history of wet nursing and the issues of women being forced to feed other children at the expense of their own and being coerced into that situation, which is why, again, I think it's really important that um, there is a set of regulations and protections for donors that uh, is kind of led by the needs and desires of milk donors to kind of build that structure so we make sure that I think People should be given the resources and tools that they need to donate if they wish, um, but really trying to avoid that problem of coercing people or forcing people or feeling putting pressure on people to have to donate. Um, I think there's definitely, if someone wants to do it, I think there should be more open-ended conversations with medical providers on what that would look like for you. What I found interesting, my findings, again, very, very small sample size, so can't generalize, but only three out of the four donors said that their medical providers spoke to them about donation, and that's where they learned everyone else either learned through friends or independent research, uh, which I thought was very interesting. So I think what I'm advocating more for is having more healthcare support so people know what the donation process is like and they can make a more informed, consensual decision for themselves whether or not they want to participate, um, knowing full well what the process is like, what that would mean for them and their families and their lifestyle, and giving them the tools to support them through that process if they would like to without putting any pressure on anyone to participate if they don't. Thank you, Virginia.